Immigrants looking for the gold of the American dream become the forgotten victims of the largest mass lynching in American history. Now that should be a movie. Hello, and thank you for watching today's episode of That Should Be a Movie. I'm C.W. Johnson Jr. Today's book I'd like to pitch as a movie is The Chinatown War, Chinese Los Angeles and the Massacre of 1871 by Scott Zeiss from Oxford University Press. The story of the Chinese and other East Asians in American history is an odyssey of tragedy and triumph that gets far less attention than it deserves. For example, the name Chinatown is synonymous with cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. However, the creation and history of these ethnic enclaves is less known. Today, I'd like to pay attention to the Chinatown in La La Land in the events of October 24, 1871. When the first Chinese immigrants arrived in the Wild West town that was 1850's Los Angeles, they settled in the oldest buildings. The area where these buildings stood was called Calle de los Negros, or in the common vernacular, Negro or Nigger Alley. The country around them was wild, with gunfights, lynchings, and vigilante committees fairly common, despite the presence of a civil government. In the 1850s, the city had a homicide rate of 12.4 per thousand people, still the record for the highest per capita homicide rate in U.S. history. By the 1870s, some of the Chinese had gotten involved in the violence to the point that they offered blood money for the death of a seraph. An American collected. However, most of the Chinese, who were mainly from southern China, had come to Gold Mountain, as they called America, to earn enough honest money to return home and claim a bride. They brought with them aspects of their home culture. One aspect was the Hinguin, a social organization similar to the Lions Club. Called companies by American newspapers, the members of Hingwins would provide loans, find jobs, and even send the bodies of their associates home. On the downside of being part of a Hingwin, a Chinese man could be beat up or robbed simply because he belonged to the same company as the person who offended his assailant. The working class C. Yup Company became the strongest one in Los Angeles in the late 1860s. The Hinglins were often confused by the Americans with the Tongos, which were more like the Mafia. While the Tongos' original purpose was benefactual, they eventually morphed into secret societies that trafficked in extortion, gambling, opium, and prostitution. Called the Fighting Tongos, they often engaged each other in gunfights and street battles. Highbenders assassins were on their payroll. The Hinguins opposed the Tongos, often pairing up with American officials to stop the trafficking of women. The feuds that arose between the Tongos and the Hinguins did not help the Chinese inmates in the eyes of an increasingly suspicious American public. The American public began to see all the Chinese as Tongos, in the same way some today see all Hispanic immigrants as MS-13 gang members. Since the Chinese were more than willing to work, they were often accused of stealing jobs. All the ethnic groups in Los Angeles, white, black, Hispanic, even Native Americans, openly despised them. It was not uncommon for any member of those groups to abuse a Chinese man in public and get away with it. 
It took the Burlington Game Treaty between the United States and the Qing Dynasty in China to give some basic protection to Chinese immigrants in 1868. However, being able to testify in court was not one of those. In 1854, in The People vs. Hall, the California Supreme Court ruled that the Chinese could not testify in court against white people. This ruling was overturned in 1873, but it would be too late for the victims of what came to be known as the Night of Horrors. The events leading up to the Los Angeles Massacre began in November of 1870. The barbaric torture and abuse of a Chinese woman named Xin Yi near San Bernardino by men to whom she was indebted to their tango sparked outrage of the whole state. In Cali des Negros, Yo Hing, whose Hong Chao company was fighting Sam Yin's Nin Yang company, to fill the void left when the Si Yup company dissolved, falsely accused one of the witnesses so they would have to come to LA and be unable to testify in court in San Bernardino against the men who abused Xin Yi. The men were still convicted on the witness of other Chinese. It was the first shot in the year-long feud between Yo Hing and Sam Yin that would include a young man running away with an older man's wife, Ye Tao, and marrying her using an American wedding certificate. And the first time a Chinese female, Amui, filed a suit in a Los Angeles court. As the year passed into fall, the battle between the two companies left the courtrooms and took to the streets. Soon, Tongo fighters began arriving from San Francisco, summoned by Sam Yin. On October 23rd, they attempted to assassinate Yo Hing, who escaped. On the evening of October 24th, one of the San Francisco Highbenders, Al Chow, was eating on the east side of Calle de Negros when he heard a commotion outside. He stepped out to have a look, and was shot and killed by one of Yo Hing's henchmen. A policeman, Jesus Bilderain, with the help of other officers and some bystanders, nearly all Hispanic, rushed to the scene and arrested the gunman. As they were escorting the highbenders out of the area, the Chinese began firing on them and at each other. Bilderain tried to capture one of the shooters and was shot in the shoulder. A civilian, Robert Thompson, rushed to the scene to assist the lawmen. As he forcefully entered one of the buildings, he was shot right above the heart. Thompson, a rancher, had many friends, and his word of his wounding and later death spread throughout the area, tempers flared. Men who had personal grievances against the criminal elements of the Chinese saw their chance for revenge. The Seraphim Marshal arrived and set up a guard around the alley to keep the Americans out and the Chinese in. With orders to suit any Chinese who left the alley if they did not obey the command to halt, they left their deputies in charge. One man, Ah Wing, tried to get through the mob. He was taken into protection by the police, but the mob seized him and physically restrained the lawmen. They took him to Tomlinson's Corral and Lumberyard. Someone came running with a rope. A boy scurried up the frame of the wide doors to help tie the noose to the frame. All Wing would be the first victim of what would come to be known as Black Tuesday. After waiting for the Chinese to try to escape the area, the mob, believing wild rumors that the foreigners were, quote, killing white men by the hole, unquote, rest one of the main buildings, the Cornell. They climbed on top and began breaking holes in the ceiling. Then they began firing down at the people inside. Someone suggested burning the Chinese out. The Chicago fire was fresh in the crowd's mind, so they brought in a fire hose to contain the fire. When cooler heads prevailed against burning the Chinese out, the mob instead tried to flush them out with the fire hose. By 8.45 p.m., the mob, tired of waiting 
and inflamed by rumors of gold in the Chinese stores, tore into the alleyway. The police tried to control the situation and save some of the people, but the mob's strength was too great. They hauled off men, claiming they were taking them to the jailhouse. Instead, they took them to Tomlinson's corral, where they hung alongside all week. The mob used the awning of John Gower's wagon shop as gallows. Despite Mr. Gower's pleas to the contrary, the mob hung others from a wagon tongue on Commercial Street. A Chinese doctor pleaded in English that he was innocent. He was shot in the mouth and then hung. The mob was a mixture of Anglo-Saxon, Irish, German, and Hispanic. Even women cheered the lynching on. From a gate post, they cut off the finger of one of the Chinese men. One of those lynched is a child, and two Chinese women are lynched. And then they torch Chinatown. The Chinese people fight back. One Chinese woman picks up a rifle that one of the vigilantes drops and starts shooting at the mob. But the mob cuts holes in the roofs of the houses in Chinatown and drops flaming torches into these holes on the roof. And Chinatown burns. As with every dark moment in history, a few lights of humanity saw. Some residents spoke out against the violence, but were told to shut up at the threat of their lives. Henry Hazard was even silent, but that did not stop him from shaming some of the vigilantes into letting their captive go. Robert Whitney organized a group which took Chinese from the mob at gunpoint. The police put the Chinese into the city jail for safety. When the mob approached, the police would say, they're all women, and the rioters would pass on. The Justice of Peace, William H. Scary, known for treating the Chinese fairly in court, hid several in his cellar. Other residents of Los Angeles hid Chinese in their homes and stores. By the time Black Tuesday was over, 18 immigrants, 20% of LA's Chinese population, was dead. None of those who were killed were members of the feuding companies. Four were shot in Negro Alley and vicinity. Two of the Chinamen hung were boys of 18 or 19 years, and one of them is said to have only been in the city a few days. The city fathers were embarrassed by the behavior of the citizenry. Newspapers declared to the nation that the city of Angels was a blood-soaked Eden. Ten members of the mob were arrested and prosecuted only eight were convicted, and all their convictions were overturned within three years due to legal technicalities. The coming years would see a rise in racial animosity against Chinese and other East Asians, known as the Yellow Peril. This unfounded fear climaxed in the Page Act of 1875, which banned Chinese women and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which banned all Chinese laborers from migrating to America. Asian Americans would experience injustice and oppression along the West Coast, similar to what African Americans faced in the Jim Crow South. They would finally receive the right to vote in 1943 with the passage of the Magnuson Act, which overturned the Exclusion Act. Sadly, the Los Angeles Massacre would not be the last instance of violence against Chinese Americans. The Hell's Canyon Massacre in Oregon in May of 1887 left 10 to 34 Chinese dead. The Rock Springs Massacre in Wyoming left out 30 Chinese dead. The San Francisco Riot of 1877 left 4 dead. The Seattle Riot of 1886, which resulted in the removal of the city's entire Chinese population. The Tacoma Riot of 1885 would also end in the expulsion of the Chinese population. And the year 1907 saw a series of anti-Asian race riots take place along the Pacific Coast. The location 
at the Calle de los Negros now lies under the asphalt and concrete of the Hollywood Freeway in the shadow of City Hall. The rest is covered by North Los Angeles Street and Union Station. One irony is that one of the lynching locations is now in the shadow of a federal justice building. Four of the folks were taken right here. And, and you know those wagons, they, they would, it was like a repair shop. And so the wagons were tilted up on one end and then that was used as an area to drop the rope and lynch the person. Besides from a three square foot plaque on the sidewalk and an annual candlelight vigil, little remains to remind Angelinos of one of the most important events in their city's history. There has been a film, The Jade Pendant, which features a massacre. However, the film was low budget, cringy, boring, and poorly acted. I'm not a prostitute. I have been in love with you ever since the first time I saw you. Worse, the massacre does not transition well into the storyline, giving it a tacked on feeling. Based on a novel, the fictional love story is nowhere as interesting as the true story. I think there should be a movie that focuses exclusively on the victims. I particularly believe that a movie about the Chinatown massacre would open up possibilities for other stories from the Asian American experience to be explored in film. From the story of the original Siamese twins, Chang and Ng Bunker, through Western settlement, to the movement for civil rights, and the service of Asian Americans in the U.S. Armed Forces, there's plenty of material to draw from. There were even Chinese on both sides of the American Civil War. Hmm, how about a parody of The Last Samurai, where an Asian guy has to teach a bunch of backwood white southern folks to defend themselves against the blue-clad soldiers of an industrialized central power? Like Tom Cruise's movie, it's kinda based on truth. Another reason I think there needs to be a movie about the Chinatown Massacre is because Hollywood doesn't like to confront the sins in Los Angeles like it does those in the American South and Heartland. Besides from films about the Black Dahlia, Charles Manson, and the racial tensions of the 1990s, and of course film history, a lot of Los Angeles' past hasn't made it onto the big screen. The gritty and grisly place that the City of Angels was during the frontier period in the 19th century has not been, with the exception of the Zora movies, featured in any major films recently. I believe the story of Victorian Los Angeles in the Chinese Massacre 1871 deserves the same kind of treatment that Martin Scorsese gave New York City in Gangs of New York. And even though an ending scene with the skyline changing over the course of time might seem like a ripoff, I would see it as fitting since the terrible night of October 24th, 1871 has vanished from memory. So that the victims of the Night of Horrors would never be forgotten, and the story of the Chinese Americans be more widely known and understood, I believe that the Chinatown War by Scott Zesk should be a movie. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. And let me know in the comment section what story from Asian American history you think should be a movie.